As I was already introduced, my name is Sebastian. I work with Impact Initiatives for three years in the field now, and I'm gonna talk about one of the initiatives that is in Impact Initiatives, which is uh, Agora. And um, yeah, what we do there, um, the topic of my talk is uh, mapping for resilience, uh, area-based approaches in humanitarian contexts. Um, there's probably a lot of words in here that need explanation, so I'm just gonna dive right in. Um, all right, so this is, when I was in university, my teachers always told me don't put any of these slides on because they're boring and there's just too much text. So here you are with a boring slide with too much text. Um, right, so uh, what happens a lot is that in crisis, um, there's lots of local actors. There's uh, local NGOs, there's local governments, there's civil society um, initiatives that actually know what is going on more or less and they, they um, oftentimes lack somehow capacity but they actually know what to do where the problems are and uh, they are also a lot of times the first people who are actually in the places where there's people that actually have some kind of need. Um, however then lots of you know aid organizations come in and they decide on the strategies usually on broader level, like lots of times on a national level. And um, there is a problem to really uh, start a conversation between local actors and then the big organizations that have the capacity, the money, and actually the, you know, the, yeah, come in and implement something. So this is already a problem. And a lot of times this ends up in duplication, in misunderstandings, in uh, local population being unhappy. And um, it's sometimes hard to, once you started off on the wrong foot, to repair that you know, kind of trust and, and what has already been done in the wrong direction. Um, so this, having this, this problem in mind, um, Agora was founded basically on, on, on these premises that there is a necessity, necessity to strengthen humanitarian action, shifting towards localized and multi-sectoral responses to needs of crisis uh, affected populations. So a lot of times uh, when there is um, a crisis that hits a population, um, humanitarian actors come in, they do something and they leave. Or the whole thing gets zoned out and then there's development actors already in the place or coming after some time and there needs to be a better uh, connection also between those two, right? This is uh, what we all heard, probably the, the so-called new way of working. And um, there's a general agreement that all of these things need to be, uh, need to you know, work better. The humanitarian actors need to better work together with development actors, but also with local uh, initiatives and local population. Um, so one approach to do this is um, the settlement approach um, to actually understand the needs that are in a, in a certain area. So a settlement approach, uh, I know in my entry slide I said area-based approach, those two things are kind of the same. Uh, it's just some people, or in some contexts, there's a problem when you say area-based approach. In some contexts, there's a problem when you say settlement-based approach. Uh, settlement for a lot of people is just a village or something, you know, it's uh, complete in, uh, you know, is an entity if you want to. An area is more something that is a little bit um, fluent. Um, yeah, so, what we're trying to do is we, we target geographically, um, um, talking about a settlement and what a settlement, what we understand as a settlement, I'm gonna go there in a minute. And um, once the settlement is identified, actually look at who are the people living there, what are the needs, the specific needs that they have, and how can we build on initiatives that are already present in that area? What are you know more fundamental needs maybe that have just been um, amplified through the crisis that struck this area? So um, yeah, and then therefore also identify and strengthen uh, synergies. All right. Um, before I get into the details, I want to take a quick step back because uh, I've been here yesterday and today and people always ask me, okay, uh, who do you work for? And I say, my, my badge here says impact initiatives. Um, 
most of the people have never heard about impact initiatives. When I tell them reach, then there's a good a fair share of people who actually heard about it. Um, so, yeah, reach is one of the initiatives by impact initiatives. Uh, Agora is another one, and Agora in the field um, is an initi initiative by impact and acted, so the French um, INGO. Um, yeah, exactly. Lots of times, Reach and Agora will, in the field, actually be the same people. Right, okay. Um, there's this activity set um, of Agora. There's uh, two, uh, sorry, four uh, activity sets. And um, in different projects that we had so far, different parts of this activity set have been implemented. So um, the, the most crucial for, for everything um, in order to make this approach work is, is the first one. So uh, development of settlement-based development plans. And um, again, at the basis of all of this, and I, I circled it here in red, is the delineation of territories and identification of local stakeholders. And this is really the, the first step when we, when we have an Agora project is look at the area that we were, you know, potentially going to work with, identify the stakeholders there and talk to them. And there's really, there, there should be a lot of stakeholder engagement, talk to the local authorities, uh, talk to uh, traditional leaders in the area, talk to um, uh, religious leaders that are in the areas and ask them, and the population of course as well, and ask them, you know, how do you see the area that you live in? So, um, Maybe by a quick show of hands, in the city that you currently live in, do you know the name of the neighborhood that you're living in? Just yes, if, if you know it. Okay, there's already a few people that did not show their hands. Very few, but there were a few. And now, do you also know if this neighborhood, oh, how can I phrase that? Okay, is the neighborhood that you're living in, is it the same name of the administrative unit that is actually governing the area that you live in? No? Okay, there's lots of people that, that, that shake their heads. So, and um, I mean, I guess most of you live in, uh, I don't know, European, Northern America, American cities where these structures are kind, you know, kind of clearly defined. Um, in lots of the countries that we work in, um, there's no clear definition of this. So uh, when we talk to authorities, they might tell us, yeah, there's a big need in neighborhood, let's say, um, Bula Bulin. Okay, and then we look at the map, we cannot find it. We look at uh, official administrative units, you know, we cannot find this place. Until we find out, no, this is just a, the, the neighborhood that is, let's say, in the center of the town that everybody just calls that way. Right? But this is the reality for the people there. The people that live there, they might not know in which, you know, let's talk in admin terms, admin one, two, three, four. Let's say four would be the smallest for the area that we're looking at. And those people, they might not even know the name of the admin four um, unit that they live in, but they know the name of the neighborhood. So this is really the reality for the people. Um, Right. Once we we identified the the, the different territories um, and we gave them a name, we need to kind of delineate this to actually know. Okay, what what are we talking about? How many people live there? What kind of infrastructure do we find in this area? And this is also an important step to kind of um, facilitate this this engagement and this conversation between international actors and the local authorities. Just, you know, think of it as a, as a dictionary, right? Um, people that just come in that have no clue of the area, they might be able to, to read a map and to, to see actually how it's delineated, give that whole thing a name, whereas the, the people that always live there, they might not know the exact boundaries, they don't, they sometimes don't know the, you know, the, the, um, the name of this admin unit, but they know the name of the of the neighborhood. And so this already is a first step to help communicate between them. All right, then um, other activities within this first uh, set of activities is uh, capacity and vulnerability assessment. So within this identified area and local development planning. So just, you know, a rough outline. 
Activity set two is uh, promoting citizen and civil society engagement. Um, this is actively identifying, okay, what are the um, civil society organizations in this area or the, you know, work within this area and see what capacity gaps are there and what can we actually do to, to help them do what they already do um, a little bit better maybe. All right, um, so I'm gonna stop here real quick. Those are the two main areas that we um, that we work with so far if <clears throat> if you go a step further then this these are usually long-term projects so with only you know within a couple of months these first two are, are usually the, the ones that we actually have time for because this is already a lot of work to you know get a lot of different people around the table and ask them to coordinate amongst themselves um, in times of crisis which you know not everybody has time for that in these in these periods. Um, right. Okay. To make this a little bit more visual and to to give you some examples. Um, so what you can see here is uh, the town of Jeremy in Haiti. And on the left hand side, you can see in is it left? Yes. Um, you can see in red the administrative boundaries um, of I forgot what, what it's called. Let's just call them wards with the with the with the English word. Um, so yeah, you can see those those lines in red on the map, and in black and also with the labels, you can see the neighborhoods that we identified together with the local population here. As you can see, there's there's not a single boundary that, that really overlaps, right? Um, basically, the, the red lines, they just cut through anything that is actually what, what the people experience. Uh, if we talk to, I don't know, the mayor of Jeremy, they hardly have any idea of where, the, where these red boundaries go because it, it doesn't play any role in, in the way that they govern the area, right? What, what is really important for them are the black areas, the, the neighborhoods. But these are not official administrative units. Right? And so it's really hard for, for any external actor to come in and understand how the local population, how the local organizations, how the local government actually works within these areas. Because if they tell you about, uh, let's say, Rochas, he, he, we have that in the middle, um, then you might have a, a vague idea where that is, but about the size, about the population that lives there, it's, it's really hard to grasp without having you know, in-depth conversations with everybody. So this mapping, what we're doing here, this is really key to, to get a common understanding for everybody. Um, I put another map on the, on the right-hand side, which already shows a little bit um, the, the issues that, that um, you know, you, you can only visualize once you, you mapped out these things. Um, so on this map, uh, we're focusing on, on health facilities and in uh, the, the little dots on top of that are pharmacies. And you can see, for example, that uh, there is a big concentration in the, in the Centreville towards the seaside. Um, and then it thins out towards the edges um, dramatically and what you unfortunately cannot really see because it's a little bit too bright. Um, there is a very high density of population in the, you know, in the, in the southern part here. Um, if, if you could see the buildings, then you would see that there's a lot of buildings there. So there's a lot of people living in that area. Um, it's kind of a slum area, but uh, if they have any mer medical emergencies, they, you know, they have to actually travel for, for quite a while. And this also shows that there is a, a big difference in the, you know, in, in the reality and the provision of services and so on. I could probably show you the same maps for water access points, for uh, shops, for you name it. There's always, you know, it's a heterogeneous um, image every time. So, okay. Um, I promised you a definition of, uh, of settlement. So, um, a settlement is a territory recognized by its inhabitants as encompassing one, a coherent socioeconomic unit, and two, a network of predictable relationships between its stakeholders. Um, yeah, I mean, the first point already uh, says it, uh, socioeconomic, um, 
you know, a homogeneous area. So um, uh, I'm currently based in Nigeria, where um, in my degree, where the wards range from a couple of hundred people to, I think, a couple of ten thousands of people in size and in, in population size, and also the the composition, the socio-economic composition within these wards is completely different. You have sl uh, slums right next to to big big um, villas where where people um, are extremely rich um, in those areas, and you you cannot really compare what you know what what access to services the the different population groups have. Uh, if you ask for the neighborhoods. There is a clear line in between there. Right. Um, most of the um, examples that I will show now and that we have worked in so far are in urban settings. So this is typically the neighborhoods that we talk about. Um, in rural settings, this could also be, let's say, a valley or um, I don't know the, the area between two forested areas that you can, you know, that kind of share the same services together, that kind of have the same life reality. Um, this is not the right computer here. Right. Um, how do we do the, um, the actual settlement delinea delineation? Um, at first, we need to get, um, we, we need to familiarize a little bit with the area so that when we go out and we, we talk to the people about, you know, different names of the neighborhoods that we should have at that point, we need to also be sure to kind of double check with them. So we need to study the um, area of interest and we need to identify certain points of interest within those areas. So typically that's street names, that is uh, natural features like rivers or sometimes big trees that you know, can, can carry any kind of name. Uh, places of worship usually are a good um, place mark. Health sites and then less important but also good to have is markets, banks and uh, schools. Um, maybe from the, no, it's again a little bit too bright. Um, so whenever we, we started one of these projects and, um, you know, since it's in a crisis area, there may or may not have been a hot, hot activation before, we found that every time there was either a hot activation or a very, very active uh, local open street map community, all of this is much easier because it provides us with so much more information that we can work on with right from the start. Um, if not, a lot of times we just, you know, go out, identify the areas, and then when we know where we, where we will actually will work, we will just use, you know, JOSM editor and add all of these things ourselves. All right. Um, Again, how, how do we do it? How do we collect the data then? So, uh, once we know a range of uh, different neighborhood names in the area that we're looking at, uh, we kind of try to familiarize, uh, place them a little bit roughly on the map, no, not drawing any boundaries, but to know, you know, northeast, southwest, a little bit where everything is. Um, and then we get in touch with local leaders and go out with them in the field, carrying a GPS device and actually surrounding the, the neighborhoods to make sure we have the exact boundaries. Um, we also ask them, you know, already some information about uh, what, what is typical for this neighborhood. Uh, if we know this is neighborhood A, uh, neighboring neighborhood B, what is the difference between those two neighborhoods? And already at that stage, you get a lot of information that is all useful later on for you know, the different activity sets. All right, so we walk around the border of the settlement. Um, we we uh, have to repeatedly ask about the confirmation that the border is really followed. And um, if time permits and if we have the capacity, we triangulate this information with focus group discussions of residents, meaning we bring out a printed map to a chosen group of people within the, uh, this neighborhood and ask them to draw on the map actually where the boundaries of, their, uh, of this neighborhood is. Uh, even with people who have very few to no knowledge of you know, map reading, this exercise works surprisingly well and it works better the more information we already have as baseline on there. Um, right. Then by rechecking with the locals, we try to minimize gaps and overshoot. And um, 
when we have a final delineation of all the different um, neighborhoods, it's always really important to recheck with the authorities and with other locals so that nobody has a problem with them. Because as you can imagine, delineating something that hasn't been delineated before and actually have a, a physical product like a paper map, this can cause some issues and uh, we just want to minimize those problems. All right. Um, here's another example of, um, of DIFA in Niger. Um, and as you can see here, um, we, we, we highlighted the different, um, different neighborhoods with different colors and um, the, all the background is uh, open street map information. Um, and you can also see here the kind of different sizes of the, of the neighborhoods. But um, when we were actually having the focus group discussions, it turned out that the, that the socioeconomic um, attributes of all of these uh, uh, neighborhoods are for each of them actually kind of the same. So all of these make sense. Um, if you have any questions to, for any of these examples or if something is unclear, please just feel free to jump in. Um, right. So where have we done this until now? Um, again, we have these uh, four activity sets, and as you can see, the first one, so the basis for everything, uh, we've done, we have quite some experience with this. So there's uh, Iraq, Syria, Uganda, Central African Republic, Colombia, Mozambique, Haiti, Lebanon, Niger, Ukraine, Nigeria, and Niger. And what is not on here is also Afghanistan. I think they just kicked it off uh, a few weeks ago. All right, and then uh, activity set two, three, and four, um, because you need you know, much more capacity, it's long-term projects, and also you need the, the appropriate funding for this, we do much less, and you know, where applicable. All right, so I was talking mostly about, um, about urban settings now. Um, uh, I briefly mentioned rural settings, but this kind of works also in refugee camp settings. So what you can see here is a Kutupalong camp in Bangladesh. And um, what we did here was the exact same thing, the exact same approach. Um, the issue in, uh, in Kutupalong was at the very beginning of you know, the whole UN system, all of the uh, INGOs coming in, that they were the, the camp was just going bigger and bigger, and so they needed some kind of um, system to to break it up into smaller pieces. So they just came up with some arbitrary um, delineation. They basically put out a map and, and drew some lines on there. Um, and then the big problem started when they tried to get uh, people from the camp to actually work with them in their projects, because they already had their system. The system was imposed by the military, so the military settled people there and asked them, okay, were you a local leader already in your, uh, in your village or anything? And if yes, they made them, um, so in, in, in Bangladesh it's called Majis, um, they made them Maji of a certain part of the camp. And this is where, you know, where the troubles began so that the people that were kind of you know, running, organizing the camp, the military, the people living there, they kind of, spoke the same language, but the people from outside, the big INGOs, they had a completely different system. So what we did there was exactly the same thing. We went in there, asked the military for a big list with all the Magis, went to every single Magi and surrounded the, the little part of the camp that they were responsible for, made a map of that, tried to overlay it with the system that was already uh, agreed upon by the um, INGOs, and then try to come up with a system that you can interchange those two and that actually, you know, the different uh, people could talk to each other. Right, um, so before I got here, I, I asked myself um, two questions or something that we all already um, thought about in the past. One was, how could these settlement boundaries be integrated in OSM? And should they at all? Because there are no official boundaries. This is really just the reality of the people, which makes it important that this is reflected in uh, you know, something as rich as OpenStreetMap, but at the same time, there is lots of room to actually contest these boundaries because they, most of them haven't been officialized. All right, so if anybody wants to 
uh, contribute to uh, you know answering these questions or uh, discuss with me um, afterwards or now I'd, I'd be very happy and um, that's it from my side thank you very much okay um, we're gonna start this question sessions please raise your hand if you have a question and get you the mic Cool, uh, great presentation. Um, I was wondering how your team um, deals with land disputes. So uh, the HOT team has done very similar work in Tanzania, and there have been a number of situations where you've had um, communities coming from different political interests, um, opposition parties, where you know disputes over boundaries was continuously a problem. And we also went through the same process of you know using the community, working with the community members to trace boundaries going back with the maps to validate the data, but still we couldn't really come to an agreement because there were just these inherent differences that were so deep-rooted that kind of go beyond just you know, a mapping exercise. So it was really just kind of curious about your experiences in the various settings that you've worked in. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, that is in, indeed a, um, an issue that we faced as well in the past. Um, Maybe we were just lucky until now, but until now we could settle all of these problems by um, communicating with the people and explaining them why we're doing this, right? It's not because we want to draw any boundaries. It is not because we want to make sure that, you know, you, traditional leader one, are responsible for this area, you, traditional leader two, are responsible for this area. Um, but we actually want to do this so that when aid is coming in or when, when you know, people from outside who have no ideas about how these different neighborhoods are, are being set up, that they have an idea of what, what it looks like on the ground. So it was very important to us to A, talk to the people who have a problem with boundary a, uh, one or two, and get them on the table with the authorities that actually could say, okay, this is now the boundary that we're going to settle on, and make sure that the people who, that have a problem get told by the authorities that no, this is nothing official. This is purely to plan and to, you know, um, make, make the, the relief efforts work better and, uh, and more, more effectively. And yeah, so again, maybe we were just lucky that this always worked in the past for us, but um, maybe that's, that's the way to go. All right. Okay, is there any other question? Oh, over there. Oh, they're making you run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need to have another mic. There's one over there. Who else? Hi, Patricia Solis, Arizona State University and Youth Mappers. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. I find it really fascinating because um, from a more sort of academic sector point of view, I see what one of the things you're trying to do is incorporate a methodology of cultural geographies, really, is what I think that you can say. And that's a really hard thing to do on such a technical project. So it's really fascinating. Um, it, it, brings to mind a problem that I have been studying in a different context about, you know, we talk a lot about data to decisions and getting the data to, you know, influence the decision making process. In this context, it's a very, you know, humanitarian process. Um, but a problem that I have discovered is when you follow that decision back to the accountability for making that decision, there's a lot of spatial incongruence with even our existing jurisdiction geographies, right? Um, call it the decision accountability spatial incongruence problem, which is a mouthful, but there's this feedback, right? Um, later on, when you want to hold the decision makers accountable for you didn't um, do this properly or we didn't get what we needed or whatever, the, just the boundaries of the jurisdictions not being congruent with the ways that the people are either elected 
or held accountable in whatever ways those things are. So I wondered if you have seen that at all in this kind of work. Do you find it to be a problem, or have you just not encountered that yet, or what your thoughts might be on that? All right. Um, the, so the question kind of goes into the same direction as the question we, we just had, um, just a little beyond that as well. And for, for, for this, I kind of also have the same, same answer. The, the key to this is really to make your methodology as transparent as possible and make sure that you're like, in, in this case, Agora, we and our team are not the ones that are deciding on anything. But we have this decision together with the stakeholders and the stakeholders not only being political figures or traditional leaders, but also people from the actual community. Um, this is also why I said that at the beginning of this whole process, it's really important to familiarize yourself a little bit with the reality in these neighborhoods, right? So as, as you learn about them, you really should make, make your own connections. So that means if I'm saying, okay, we, we have to talk to the, or make this decision together with the people living in these areas to be inclusive and not to, uh, you know, if there's, I don't know, two different ethnic groups living in the same, uh, same area, but they have this, I don't know, for some reason they're just living in the same area, um, to make sure we actually have people from both ethnic groups. That we have men and women, that we have uh, people with disabilities, that we have elderly people in, in these uh, focus group discussions. Um, and so far, again, maybe we were just lucky, but uh, so far this actually was the key to um, not having these issues later on. Of course, when, I mean, lots of this, this first activity set is really just getting a better understanding so that other people then can come in and we just, you know, basically build a bridge so that the um, relief workers then can, you know, better target the people. So that kind of takes the responsibility a little bit from those who actually deliver something and disconnects it from, from, from us who kind of uh, delineated this, um, whereas we have the connection to the people that actually help delineate this. Um, so it's kind of diffusing the, the problem a little bit that, that you were um, talking about. And um, of course, if something gets delivered, there's always going to be people who, who feel you know, unfairly treated and but these are the problems that we already have without this approach, so, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. This really challenges my assumptions of what, how I would define settlement, so it's really interesting to hear about it. Um, I think you've kind of touched on this in some of the previous questions, but um, I was gonna ask how you ensure that you have a representative sample from each settlement area um, and how you, what measures you take to m make sure that women and men are speaking their opinions about what constitutes their socioeconomic settlement unit or differences in age or education levels um, beyond just <clears throat> people who are local leaders who are now local leaders in this new settlement area? Yeah. So, um, right. Um, it, it, for the case of really delineating uh, a settlement unit, um, surprisingly, we never, not that I can think about, had the issue of um, different groups defining the settlement in a different way. You know, maybe different individuals, but it's not like men would define it different than women, or you know, this ethnic group would define it different than this. Um, there's usually a, a big consensus uh, on these questions. However, um, we also have to look at the, you know, the, the, the structure of the population in there. And this is actually where, where you, yeah, you, what, what you were saying actually plays a huge role. And, um, so this is how, mainly why, why we, why we do all of this. Um, to your question, how we make, how do we make sure that we actually, you know, get a full representation of the, the, the composition of the, the people that are there? Um, we try as much to you know, learn upfront about the composition of the population in those areas and then base our you know, sampling on that and also have focus group discussions with only men, focus group discussions with only women, mixed focus group discussions and you know, see if, if there's a difference in, in the outcomes of these then probably we have to uh, look extra hard to not um, 
yeah, bias our 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 reports or whatever we write. Um, but if the information we get out of these is more or less the same, then this is one less problem that we have to worry worry about. You know, of course we have to keep it in in the back of our heads that these realities exist, but it's it's not becoming a huge problem. So I'm, I'm not sure. I hope that was satisfactory. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, it's I want to unpack even to 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 push the thinking even further. That's a very interesting phrase you put there. Should we even put boundaries in? In OSM, as we all know, boundaries, we want to be inclusive, right? But boundaries themselves, especially the polygons that we make, are inherently exclusive. Yes. By closing that polygon, you exclude another place, another settlement. So there's, I don't think that could be totally resolved forever. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, uh, I'd like to share exper an experience during Haiyan after 2013. So we, we were a local team. We use OSM data from the mapathons in a previous life, in a previous job. And we were in a village meeting in the islands. And we, were, we wanted to talk about disaster risk and all that. And we put some of the boundaries from the official sources and different ones. Our objective was to talk about resilience, vulnerability, et cetera, recovery. But people thought about the boundaries instead. So we were thinking, well, did it help that we put the boundaries there? Did we actually help create more social capital in the participatory? mapping exercise, because my training in Manila was very colonial, you know, the Spanish type of puta cadaster, this is your territory, this is mine. And historically, the Philippines is a space of networks between islands. We didn't have this before. So that's, this is just years after the experience of looking back. Should I, was it the right decision for us to put the boundaries there? Because suddenly, as the so-called GIS experts, Back then, people looked to us, hey, you, you the GIS guy from Manila, I think you could solve this boundary dispute between my village and that village. But our purpose is, no, you had a disaster, that's kind of the, that should be an issue for later, we're talking about uh, water, etc. And suddenly it became kind of a turfing activity. I'm just putting it out for us to, to think about. But thanks for the very provocative presentation. Well, thanks for sharing that. Okay, any more questions? Oh, wonder. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, so much for um, your work and that talk. Uh, I guess three comments. One was that uh, we mapped in, in, in OpenStreetMap, we tend to map um, in terms of the, the, uh, the extent of boundaries rather than perhaps the perception so much. And I know that uh, Reach well, impacts have been doing work in northern Uganda on this uh, to do with more perception. I was going to come back to that, but just at one point on on um, David's, just to add, was that in Sierra Leone we found people self identifying in their own chiefdoms, sections of chiefdoms that were geo geographically uh, remote from the main chieftain, but they self identified there. Um, just a little comment to throw in, which is interesting. To, uh, to food for thought um, and then just to also the awareness that we very recently had um, our proposal from um, the Ugandan refugee settlement addressing um, conventions accepted by Open Street Map Foundation so now there is a convention for uh, refugee settlements um, which has a parallel uh, administrative boundary and tagging system uh, so that's something to be aware of. Uh, we, we put in for that a year and a half ago and it's finally been accepted. Um, so well well done to the team in Uganda. But um, I was going to remind or see if you had any comments about impact um, in Arua. I know a project in northern Uganda there where they, and coming back to a point earlier on, where they talk to people within a settlement administrative boundary and they, then they would talk to those people about the neighboring um, understanding of their boundary. Then when they went to the neighboring boundary, they would then cross-reference back. So you had, um, I found that a very interesting concept, and I think it comes back to some of the comments earlier. I wondered if you, you can expand at all on that. Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you for, for the comments. And then um, we did do that. Um, so out of 
all of these here. I personally, I was only involved in um, in Haiti, in Niger, and uh, now in Nigeria. So I can't really talk for all of them. It might be that in other cases they they did more extensive work on this. Um, but I know that uh, specifically in Niger, in Difa, we had a lot of time to actually conduct uh, focus group discussions with the people from these neighborhoods. And there we also asked, okay, so if you define your area as, you know, name A, uh, and name B is the neighboring uh, neighborhood, what, what, what are the differences, right? And then build on that a little bit. So we touched on this, maybe not as um, in-depth as, as we could, but um, yeah, and it was also quite interesting. And uh, since uh, we, we had this, you know, the technical side of, uh, okay, polygons um, and boundaries, uh, this is actually something we do when we do the, the, the focus group discussions and the participatory max mapping exercise. We don't use polygons, but actually points. So we just put, you know, at a, at a place where we're absolutely certain that this is, you know, part of the of the neighborhood somewhere around the center, or what we believe is somewhere around the center, we just put a point. We don't put the the delineation there um, yet because we we can't be sure until we actually get shown. Because as soon as you present a map with some lines on them to somebody and ask them to redraw the lines, um, it's much much harder, especially for people who are not as used to, you know, reading maps as as we all are, because um, a lot of people don't doubt maps that much as as we are, you know. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we need to finish the session questions because we have a break right now at three. Uh, it's 30 minutes. At four, there's a talk about using AI to map the world with Facebook. And at five, we have a code for Africa. So thank you. Thank you.